the um, some of the things I wish I had known when I first started uh, when I first started investing. Uh, some quick background. Um, yeah, as I've started and sold three internet companies. I'm now uh, working on my fourth startup. Um, I'm an investor uh, and an entrepreneur. So I've been on both sides of the table. Uh, over the years, I've invested in over 100 startups and um, 25 in the last two years. So uh, on average, I do about one a month. And I've had uh, 20 plus exits uh, in total since I first started uh, investing. Most of the data I'm going to share is um, data that I've uh, data from my investments up until uh, 2018. Um, for the last uh, three, uh, since 2018, most of them are still, um, many of the most of them are still in play. And many of them are still, the markups are still um, on paper. So I'm not really diving into those investments. Uh, so sectors that I invest in, uh, there's, um, there's AI and deep tech, um, a blockchain. Um, so I pretty much uh, invest in, in sectors in all over the place. Um, I, am, I tend to be quite, I tend to be quite sector agnostic. So some of the some of the exits I've had over the years, um, my the best investment by far has been a cryptocurrency company called Ripple. Um, so that was a 150x return. And then these are all uh, returns in cash. Uh, and I'll be diving into many of them in more detail in terms of some of the lessons learned from these uh, from these investments. And I'll, I'll also be covering a few of my misses, uh, some uh, my, or my anti portfolio companies I wish I had invested in. And what sort of what lessons I've learned from that? So typical investment size. Um, this is in U.S. dollars between uh, fifty thousand and hundred thousand. Uh, this is uh, my own capital that I invest. So I'm not uh, investing through a fund or through a syndicate. I invest directly in startups, uh, pre-seed and and seed stage. Um, so most of them are very early. Uh, most of them are. Uh, pre-product, or they may have some sort of a early early version or a beta, and um, and many of them are, uh, and almost all of them are pre-revenue. So uh, come in come in really early. Um, I love being the um, the first check in, um, and um, yeah, I um, some some of the investments I'm most proud of are where I was the uh, where I was the first investor. Um, yeah, something I learned as an entrepreneur is most it's a little easier once you have the initial investor on board or initial commitment, then it becomes a lot easier to uh, to close around. Uh, very few investors typically want to be the first one. Most investors like to see it as a bit of a moving train, you know They want to be the last one before it catch the trade. Not many have the courage and conviction, unfortunately, to uh, to commit early, especially if you're a first time entrepreneur. So I love uh, if I uh, when I find a deal that I'm that I where I have high conviction, I love to be uh, the first investor on board. Any 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 it's a small group, so I can you know tailor my tailor it a little more. Uh, any is the speed okay? Is so any questions so far? I mean, can when you, you're doing okay. those initial investments like that, and you like to be the first on board. Do you let other people invest alongside you with that initial? Yeah. Tip? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so so typically, so these, uh, so I don't lead uh, investment. I don't, not anymore. Uh, I don't lead investment rounds. So typically, it's um, so these are relatively small investments. So fifty k to hundred k. In uh, done most of my recent investments have been in the UK. The typical size of a seed round is about half a million pounds, so about six hundred thousand dollars or so. So it's a small part of a seed round. Uh, so I typically, uh, the way it works is as a lead investor who has negotiated terms, and I'm coming in for a part of the round. Um, I used to do more. I, I've done some lead investing, um, but I don't uh, don't do that anymore. I've just found it to be very very uh, time consuming to do it properly. So typically, I um, I come in as as a part of a round. So 50k to 100k is usually you know if it's a 500k round. It's about five percent. A hundred fifty k investment would be ten percent of the round. Mm 
where do I invest? Um, I've done um, 80. So I, I was based in the US. I went to university in the US and I was based in the US for about uh, 25 years. So uh, most of my initial investing was in the US. And about five years ago, I moved to the UK. And uh, more many of my more recent investments have been in the UK. Um, the rest have been the rest have been all over. Um, yet to make my first investment in New Zealand, uh, but I'm going to be in uh, in New Zealand with my family uh, for a few months. Um, uh, moving actually moving there next week, so I'm very excited about seeing some good deals in New Zealand and making some investments in New Zealand. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, I have uh, I tend to um, I tend to invest. I like to invest in um, uh, in the in the location where I am. So when I was in the US, I would do most of my investments. When I was in San Francisco, I did most of my investments in uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and um, in the UK, I've been based in London, and I've been doing most of my investments um, uh, in in the UK now. I, te I tend to like to um, meet with entrepreneurs in person and connect with the founders. Um, so, um, which is why I prefer to do, um, investments in the area where I'm based at the time I've sort of, uh, traveled all over. So, uh, wherever I'm based, although a few of these other companies I'm talking about have been, um, I met the founders on trips to these countries, except for the South Korean one, where I met the founder in the UK. Ramesh, have you found that that will change much now, you know, how COVID's made more people, um, make investments online? Yeah, yeah. So I did. A, so I was uh, during COVID. Of course, I made most all uh, most of my all my investments were made online. Um, something I noticed um, in London. This uh, uh, started about a year ago. In in many of the deals that were competitive, um, investors who were actually present had a had a big competitive advantage because the um, you know people were just keen, both the founders and other investors who share deals but just more keen on uh, interacting in person as sort of a reaction to COVID, right? It's, uh, similar to what's happening from some of the work from home stuff. Many, uh, many employers now are moving, are going hybrid or going back to the office. So I found something similar happening with, uh, especially with competitive deals. Uh, although during COVID, I think many US investors, many US investors, um, US were investing directly in, in startups in London. Uh, and as a result, the valuations in the UK also went up a lot because many, uh, many startups are getting investments directly from funds and investors uh, from the US. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, that's my, I, I was, there was also, maybe it's also part of it is a little, uh, was a little fatigue with just doing it online. We just wanted to just interact with people in person. So, uh, but I've always had a preference to meet the, to meet the founders in person. So in terms of uh, how I've done so far, um, so in about forty percent of my investments, I get uh, I get zero back. Um, Thirty percent, it's close to my money back. So some anywhere from point you know point seven point eight x to about one point two x. That is the other thirty percent that makes it really interesting from a financial standpoint. Anywhere from uh, three three x uh, to a hundred x. And off that, off the, off that thirty percent, you'll see it's um, about maybe one to two percent. I mean, of the about uh, one to two percent of the total is going to be a hundred x. So it's uh, you have so um, it's a very very small percentage of your investments that actually give you a good return when with angel investing. It's really it's it's really really difficult. So I'm going to uh, go into a few um, few uh, investments that I that some highlights uh, investments from where um, where which have been good financially and from which I also learned some uh, valuable lessons. So one of my when I first got into um, angel investing, um, which was after I sold my first startup, it was uh, it was a little more ad hoc. Uh, I was just uh, in, I was investing in investing in friends companies. Um, I had been through, um, it was quite, it had been quite a struggle for me as a first time entrepreneur uh, to raise capital um, for my own startup uh, because I didn't have a track record, et cetera. So I wanted to, I started off wanting to help my friends who were starting companies. So that's how I first started. 
So I would, so uh, this was sort of, this was in, this was in those days when I did the, a little after that. Uh, so ABG, I would say was my first sort of more of a professional investment where uh, it was not a, it was not a friend's company that I invested in. And um, I happened to be in uh, traveling through the Czech Republic at that time. And um, actually I happened to be traveling the Czech Republic um, a few months before this happened. And uh, and met some local investors uh, during my during my trip there, and um, went on to help one of the investors' uh, portfolio companies. I put the portfolio, the founder of the portfolio company, uh, with some of my uh, connected him with some of my contacts in San Francisco, and kept in touch with this with this investor. And then he uh, met. Uh, mentioned this deal AVG, which is a which is now a public publicly traded uh, security software company um told me about AVG, and i it was actually a very very competitive local deal um uh in uh in the czech republic but i was uh, able to get into that deal because of my because i'd helped the, one of the investors portfolio companies before so the investor was very very keen on having me uh on the cap table um so um, I got the deal thanks to good collaboration with local angels. So I think if you are uh, if you are if you are uh, getting into early stage investing and want um, and want want to get good deal flow, I mean deal flow is going to be is the heart of good investing, right? You need to see a lot of lot of uh, lot of interesting deals to be to be able to make to be able to make those good bets. And uh, one way to get better deal flow is to either directly help the founders, where um, and then founders will tell their friends and tell them tell their their fellow entrepreneurs that you want this investor on your cap table. He can add value. So that's one way to get better, to get good deals. And the other way to get good deals is to help investors with their portfolio companies. So if it is um, if it is something you're just uh, getting into. And this is a good way to sort of increase your chances of getting good deal flow just by being helpful to founders and um, or uh, or other investors. Um, so I've got this because the investor was very keen on having me uh, as a shareholder. Um, one of the mistakes I did make was, uh, uh, and I'll cover this a little more, was I uh, I had the chance uh, to do a secondary and. Um, which is where you can sell a part of it, where you can sell your stake before the company gets acquired or before the company goes public. And the mistake I made was very, was I, I cashed out my entire 100% stake. So uh, what I what I learned from that is, um, you know, keep some, you know, keep some money on, you know, it's good to getting liquidity is a good thing, but it's also good to keep some money on the table for for uh, you know for a uh, for for a you know a Raja moonshot return. So it was still a very good return. It was still a 25x return. But the if I had kept even a small fraction of that, say 20% of that, that would have gone on to have been under the 10x. So um that's it, it, it is it is a tricky, it is a tricky one though, because it's because the whole evaluation process for um evaluating, you know, a deal when it's um at this stage. So this was. They were being the company was being valued at around seventy five million. It's a little different from evaluating an early stage, a very early stage deal, which is less about um, uh, which is less about the revenues and it's um, so the the whole criteria was very was very different, which is what made it made it harder for me to evaluate. But uh, looking back, uh, I would still I would always leave something on. I would always I'll never cash out a hundred a full one hundred percent again if I have the option to do so. If I have the option to keep something on the table, let you know go uh, continue continue to go for the ride uh, in that situation. So that was that was the uh, sort of an early sort of early um, experience with um, uh, with sort of a more professional investment. This was back. I made the investment back in uh, was it it was two, late two thousand three, and I was able to was very lucky. Got able to was able to uh, 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 you know liquidate my stake about eighteen months after. So it was a it was a very very uh, good return uh, in terms of um, in in that in that short in that short time frame. 
one of the uh, one of the other um, investments that I made, which is um, which has been a great sort of return, financial return, was the was a was a cryptocurrency company called Ripple. Um, I invested in their seed round uh, in I think it was March 2013. And um, Ripple went on to create this. Uh, the company, the, uh, the company was was uh, uh, was what was it called at that time? They had it. It was called some labs at that time. Ripple Labs. Yeah, it was called Ripple Labs. And they went on to form a, to have this token called XRP, which became which is one of the which is a, a, a successful cryptocurrency uh, token. And um, this was uh, this was through Ripple is still not public, so this was actually uh, uh, got my return in a series of uh, secondaries where I sold these my shares in Ripple to uh, to other to other investors. Um, Do you still invest in crypto now, Ramesh? Yes, yes, I'm still I'm still not I, I haven't been I haven't been very active recently uh, in, mm. in crypto, but uh, yeah, I still I'm still very interested in blockchain and blockchain startups. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the some of the um, the the factors which uh, which led to it being a successful investment. Bitcoin was I just I'd heard about Bitcoin a couple of months ago. This was in early 2013. And Bitcoin was already on a tear; it had gone up, and uh, it was very, very raw at that time. So Ripple's um, their value prop was actually to be a better version of Bitcoin, a version of Bitcoin with better settlement mechanics, and um, a Bitcoin plus uh, plus. And um, that was that was what they wanted to apply it to the uh, for the uh, money transfer market for the global money transfer market. So they were going after they were going after a huge market, um, and it was also being led by uh, the CEO had had an experience in had had experience before, but hadn't had a successful exit under the belt. He was a super smart, super talented, very very driven founder, and um, he was you know hugely motivated to create a big outcome. So that was uh, that was a big factor. In the success of in the in the success of Ripple, and I also um, I shared this deal with a friend of mine who is a uh, who has who has formed who has started very successful fintech companies, and his um, his advice to me was not to invest uh, in Ripple, and fortunately I, I didn't I didn't I didn't take I didn't take his advice, and uh, brings up an interesting point about you know about getting do you want to get uh, um, the advice from experts in the domain because when you're doing as an angel investor there may be there are, there are always going to be people who understand the domain better than you um so it's an interesting one i mean i think um most uh, you just have to realize that most experts have their own biases so if you under, if you can understand what they where they're coming from it can it can help it can help with that but um in it, quite often experts can can get it wrong when it comes to Especially if it's if it's a company that's going to be disruptive uh, in in their sector. Um, I mean, the other uh, the uh, one more example that comes to mind is Airbnb. Uh, if you had gone and spoken to experts in in the hospitality industry or the hotel industry, they would have probably many of them would have probably said, "No, it's not. It's not a good investment. It's going to be. It's it's these are illegal. It's going to be." They're going to be uh, regulatory barriers. It's just not going to work. People are not going to want to stay in apartments where the towels are not clean or whatever. <laughs> uh, don't have professional hotel standards. So uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, they can they can get uh, experts can get it wrong. I think it's it depends on how you. So you have to, um, you know, if you're getting into angel investing, you have to develop your own sort of style and see um, what works for you. So the lessons, the lessons I'm sharing are lessons that work for me. So for me, it, it's often the way I like to do it is I'll, uh, I, I, I would like to get their, I would like to get their opinion, but you know, take it, take it to the barrel full of salt. Uh, the the opinion of a sort of a domain expert. So I didn't, I fortunately I didn't listen to the advice of a fintech expert before uh, investing in Ripple and. Um, it's also uh, it's in one of the, in a prior investment, I 
think that I had listened to the advice of someone who had much more experience than me and decided to pass on that investment. Uh, and that was actually, um, that was that was sort of what led me to completely ignore the advice of, an, of a FinTech expert here. And it's and it, that's it's even more frustrating when you when you go against your gut, and uh, and then you at, at least if you, if you invest if you make the decision based on your gut you have you can say oh yeah I uh, you know these this is a tough but if you if this is a tough game to be playing uh, misses a part of the game but if you do it because of the because of the advice if you miss on a big investment because of the advice on of someone else uh, I'll tell you it's even more it's even even it's even more frustrating you'd be kicking yourself even more. Uh, one more, another uh, example. Most of you have probably not heard of this company. Uh, company called uh, Is uh, Isaya. Was a this was a company I was based in New York at the time, and this is a company uh, that was actually founded by a close friend of mine uh, from university. And they were providing uh, data migration solutions for internet service providers. Uh, so their product would let you. This was in the I invested in them back in two thousand. One of my it was one of my early investments actually, uh, as an angel investor, and their product let you uh, migrate uh, from one email account to the other. So if you had an account with AOL, and you wanted to move your move move to say Yahoo Mail uh, or or to Hotmail, they would um, they would work with they actually sign deals with the ISPs. So they're working with um, uh, with Hotmail. Um, our, our MSN, and they would transfer all your emails from one account to the other. Made it really easy to switch. Their product was called True Switch. Made it really easy to switch from one uh, email account to the other. Sounds like a bit of a trivial, a, a trivial product, but it was actually a very, very uh, useful product for consumers. And um, one of the one of the uh, uh, interesting things about their business was they were able to charge both the ISPs. So they would charge um, a Hotmail $10 to everyone who switched from AOL, and they would charge AOL $10 to everyone who switched from Hotmail to AOL. Uh, Google went on to, be, uh, to become a large um, customer of theirs. Uh, there were a lot of people switching who wanted to switch from Hotmail to Google, uh, and they would pay, uh, they would pay uh, Isaiah um, for that. And um, yeah, they went on to be uh, acquired by by LinkedIn for uh, for about eighty million in in cash and LinkedIn stock. Uh, another funny uh, aspect of this story is LinkedIn was actually founded four years after after Isaya, um, and um, they went on to be acquired by LinkedIn. So it is actually a very it is a, a very good return. Uh, one one of the reasons uh, for the for the return being. Um, such a good multiple was because there was very little dilution. Uh, Isaya had not raised uh, much capital, and um, as a result, the the founders and the investors did very very well. Um, so this has been a better return than many uh, than many of my investments, where the exit figures have been much higher. Um, where there was there was one company that so Isaya was acquired in two thousand twelve. Uh, many years after my investment, but there was one company that was acquired for a company called Mashery, which was acquired for about 180 million around the same time, uh, and that was um, that was re a relatively small return. It was a 10x return, still a, a, still a very good return, but relatively small because of all the the dilution that Mashery had uh, um, found uh, uh, shareholders had to go through because they had raised a lot of capital. So one more uh, something else is an, that you should ask yourself as an angel investor is how much capital would the company need to raise uh, over its lifetime before it can be before there's an exit, because if a company needs a lot of capital, that's going to uh, that's going to dilute you. Um, most almost all the time, angel investors don't have any anti dilution uh, rights, and uh, and that's really going to bite into your return. Uh, the dilution can really bite into your return. So if a company, if you're investing, let's say a small amount in a very early stage company that's going to need a lot of capital over its life cycle, it has to be a massive exit for it to uh, generate a good return for you. Sometimes these compass, these smaller exits, a relatively small exits, like an 80 million exit can be a better return if the company does not need too much capital. Like with Isaiah's, um the company was only four people, 
uh, four founders and they had a, uh, a team of, I think a team of contractors uh, in Mexico. Um, and uh, it was, um, so they didn't, it was actually a very, very capital efficient business, uh, which is why they didn't need to raise, um, raise much outside capital after their initial seed round. And that led to a very good return. Some other, um, you know, learnings from uh, from Isaiah um, that uh, some of these, you know, obscure niches can be great investments, especially if you have a if that's a niche you understand, and if you have a competitive advantage over other investors in evaluating uh, such uh, such investments. So uh, in Isaiah's case, it was a very it was not something that most venture capitalists when were interested in. It was just not seen as uh, interesting enough, a uh, big enough return. Um, and um, for, I mean, I, I was, I was the, in, in terms of category, the category was sort of interesting. Uh, but for me, the, uh, the main reason I invested was the, uh, was the massive sort of uh, drive of the founders. I knew the founder very well from university. So I knew he was hugely driven to create a, uh, to create a, a uh, you know, a big outcome, and uh, which is a re which is the main reason I invested. So, um, yeah, uh, that was uh, that was the that was a major factor driving a good return in Asaya. And was and another interesting sort of learning from this investment was um, the found since the the company was doing very well in terms of revenues, the founders uh, were able to take were able to um, take something off the table. Um, in uh, some of their shares of the table, which put them in a very strong position financially uh, and personally. So when LinkedIn first came with their initial offer, the initial offer was about half of, of what they actually landed up selling for. The founders were able to walk away and really, really and negotiate a very, very good offer. Uh, and, it's, and one reason they had the courage to walk away was because they were in a strong financial situation. So it's an it's actually when when you when the topic of secondaries come up, many um, investors um, they have this sort of knee jerk reaction. That, oh, secondaries are not going to be good because now the founders are not going to be hungry. Founders are supposed to be hungry to go for this for this large outcome. Yes, there is some truth to that, but if they're going to be worrying about paying their mortgage, and if they're struggling uh, personally, then they're going to make the wrong decisions. Then they're going to take the first. You know, uh, you know, ten million dollar offer of even a five million dollar offer that's going to come their way if it's going to lead to uh, financial stability. So um, I think as I think secondaries can be very very good both for um, founders because it lets them now not have to worry about paying their bills etc. And now they can focus more better on going for a big outcome and also for early investors. Uh, it provides some liquidity for early investors. So I think um, I think secondaries are a, are a very good thing. That's and they have become they weren't very common when I started investing. Um, I think a, a big reason for that was because uh, venture capitalists did not like founders to be taking you know cashing out early. Uh, um, and but now they're becoming more common, uh, and uh, which is a good thing. Another um, another um, investment highlight is a is a mobile marketing company called First Screen. Um, another sort of under the it's a company uh, Dutch founders based in Dubai, um, and they provide uh, mobile marketing solutions for primarily for operators. And that was uh, that's the return is interesting because it is not not just the um, the size, but it's actually been a return in dividends. So the company still has the chance of being acquired. And they have been providing it's over the years, they have provided a 40x return uh, in terms of dividends, which would be very, very atypical for a Silicon Valley startup. So this was um, this was sort of more of an under the radar investment, um, not sort of chased by the typical you know Silicon Valley investor. So sometimes, as I said, sometimes these investments can make sometimes these sort of opportunities uh, can be great investments. Um, once again, I knew the founders, uh, I knew the founders well, hugely driven founders. Uh, so it is their drive that has sort of uh, led to this, led to the success. Um, one more, I mean, one more takeaway from, from
from this is uh, I think it's good to have some sort of a mix in your portfolio between these under the radar investments, especially if you, I mean, not all obscure are, all are going to be are going to uh, lead to good returns and these sort of more, more competitive, very hot deals. So Ripple, Ripple, on the other hand, was a highly competitive oversubscribed deal that I, that I, uh, that I got into. Um, and uh, so I think it's good to have sort of a mix see and 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 over time you have a you'll develop a better intuition of you know where you where you are uh, what's doing better for you and where you want to spend more time and prioritize so i would say have a mix in your portfolio of uh, of both these types of deals some of the some of the uh, investment misses uh, one of them was uh, one of them was uber um would have been a 5 uh, 5000x investment uh, return um, if, uh, if I, of course, if I'd held my stake to live in public and, um, it was, um, this was back in, I had the chance to invest back in 2000, 2010, when they were raising, uh, when they were raising a seed round, um, they had, a. Uh, this was the initial email that I got from, uh, from AngelList. And then I had this, uh, shared, I mean, exchanged multiple emails with the, uh, with the, um, with the CEO at that time, Ryan Travis was not the, was not the CEO at that time. And, um, it's, uh, when I, when I, look, when I read this email, it's still sort of mind boggling how small they were when they first started, um, 10 drivers doing 10 plus rides on weekend evenings. And, uh, so, um, I think the main, the biggest sort of lesson, uh, the, you know, now, I mean, I, 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 now you know I cry. I mean, I'm gonna say I cry almost every time I take it when I think about this. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't really matter now, right? What matters now is finding the next big investment, and it's a very, very uh, useful reminder that most big things on the internet start really small, really small. The other, the other miss was a uh, was Twilio. Uh, that would have been uh, a, a thousand x uh, return had, had I investment uh, had I invested. Um, I was um, okay. I don't have. I was actually uh, um, introduced to the uh, to the founder of Twilio by a good friend of mine in Seattle, who had introduced me to another startup from Seattle a few months before, in which I invested. And that startup was. Uh, I was actually quite disappointed in the communication. Uh, by the founders in that startup. So when I saw this um, saw this email from from my friend, uh, it said another Seattle startup uh, that I want to introduce you to. I said no. I, I just told myself no, uh, no more, no more Seattle startups. I'm done with Seattle startups. No more Seattle startups for me. And um, so really a good example of really lazy pattern matching, where I just sort of I didn't even explore it further just because of the fact that they were based in Seattle. Uh, how are we doing on time so far, Michelle? Uh, yeah, no, that's great. And I'm just laughing yeah. my head off here at so many of these funnies because even when you were talking back at your 100 times, because like we've only had like a couple uh, in that area where the original founders, so that's like of trade me and zero, you know, would have got 100 mm. times. So it's just cracking me <laughs> out here. You're, yeah, you're, because yeah. you've got so many more, your choice. So many more companies. misses. Yeah, many, many more misses, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, with, your with, choices yeah. are so much more. Your numbers are just so much higher. Yeah, that's interesting. Keep going. This is great. Um, yeah, there's another another example. I mean, these are, I'm sharing these examples not because of the interest. The numbers are not that. The returns are not that. In absolute numbers, not that interesting. But there was some interesting learnings uh, from Enrelate. It's actually run by a very good. Uh, it was run by a very uh, by another by a friend of mine. Um, and they were sold uh, two years after they started for twelve million. So relatively a very a, 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 a relatively quick exit. Um, and they had the they were doing phenomenally. They had really good traction um, in in what they were doing. And they were actually a content recommendation, one of the early content recommendation companies. So when you're on a publisher side, they will they will make other recommendations. You may want to see this this other. Uh, uh, article and this these are highly relevant articles otherwise they won't do they don't work and they were all sort of a sponsored content uh company and um 
they were, um, you know, they were doing their, their traction was phenomenal. But the, the, the one of the reasons the, uh, the founder decided to sell was because uh, uh, this was, he, he owned a significant chunk of the company, more than 50%. And I've, uh, the, the, I've had this discussion, the founder, he's happy for me to share this information. Um, he, he owned about 50% of the company. So for him, it was actually, for someone who was still very young, it was actually a, a, a phenomenal a financial return. And it was a great return for investors too, a, six, a 6x return in two years. Um, so I think the, the, for me, the takeaway from there was, you know, fortunately for me, the entry valuation was very, very low. I came in at a 2 million valuation. But if let's say my if my entry valuation had been more like the typical um, you know Silicon Valley seed valuation today eight to ten million would have been a very would have been a mediocre return for the risk you're taking. Um, so the major sort of takeaway for me from this um, was that you know almost all the time the find the found if the founder has a personal financial goal that's going to determine the size of the outcome. So if, let's say the if the founder has a personal financial target of, of 5 million and he owns 50% of the company or he or she owns 50% of the company, it's going to be, it's highly unlikely that the exit, the exit is going to be more than 10 million. So it's, um, so it's something that as an angel, it's, and it's, and this can, of course, it can, it can change. I mean, sometimes these, you know, the goalposts can shift once the company is doing really well, founders can revisit their initial financial goals. But in my experience, that's quite rare. Uh, if if the founder has has a personal financial goal um, in as as a as a target, that's going to limit. That can limit this. That can also, if it's a if it's a large financial goal, it's going to increase the chances of a larger outcome. But if it's a small, if it's a relatively small financial goal, uh, in you know, it's uh, six million is not by most standards not. But it's all these are all relative, right? So it's it's going to limit the size. It's going to limit the size of the outcome. Um, so something to keep in mind, especially especially if the entry. It's more of a factor of the entry valuation is high. Now I've seen some I've seen some deals where the entry valuations are you know ten million, fifteen million dollars, and uh, there's a, and you and you get this and the and you get and you get this impression that and these are really really high and the founders are going to are not going to walk away from you know a 20 million offer or a 30 million offer because it's going to be the personal financial stakes for them are just too high um so it's not something that people in silicon valley actually even to talk about that much because you know founders are supposed to be the founders read this article uh, a while back and it's it's very i can i can relate to that founders are supposed to be like jesus it's supposed to be very 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 pure they're doing it for you know, for good. Yes, I mean that's a big factor, but they're 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 all the founders are also, you know, driven by financial. As entrepreneurs, they're also driven by the financial return. And if they have a lower sort of financial target, um, it's going to limit your your return. And I and I and I have and I have some you know as an entrepreneur. I have some good experience here as well. For my first, for my first startup, one of the uh, one of the reasons um, you know we decided to sell was because it more than met the financial goals of our of the founders, and it also provided it also provided a good return for the for the investors. So once that sort of bar was met for us, we were uh, it became a very easy decision. I mean, the question. So this was we sold we sold this company for uh, this was a this was a thirty this is a thirty million plus exit. The question as founders that we asked ourselves is that that was basically the proceeds from the exit was basically all the money we had we had we had we had zero savings. The question we asked ourselves as founders is was if all we had was this much would we invest it all in our startup? And the answer to that was no. So it became a very easy so uh, it became a very easy decision. For us to sell, so that's something I've asked. I've asked myself, and as an investor, I mean, the last thing you want to be doing is trying to come in the way of a young founder trying to achieve, you know, financial financial stability. So, um, so that's something you just do not want to do. Um, so, when you invest, you want to make sure that in the best case, it's going to be a good return.
Another sort of example where um, this was a company that was actually hired uh, by Amazon, uh, and um, I had the I had the feeling that the that the that the I had this sort of uh, and this was one of, this is an investment that I actually led. I had the feeling that the founder would go for um, would not really go make an honest attempt at a huge outcome. Um, so we had we had liquidation preferences in the uh, in in our investment where there would be at least a three x return for the early investors. Um, so they so the, the company sold for less than three x. Investors would get investors would still get a three x, and then the um, then the proceeds would be divided. Um, and that was actually something I'll never do again. In general, I'm, I want to, I want to stay away from. Uh, Spending too much time negotiating valuations now—that's something I've learned uh, with with founders because um, you know it, it's an it's an unpleasant it's an unpleasant discussion. And quite often, these things if the, if the company is going to be if, if the company is going to be uh, it's these are quite binary. So whether you come in for twenty five at, at a valuation that's twenty five percent higher is not really going to matter if the company is going to get if the company is going to get acquired for a massive multiple. So it's something I and and plus you know I'm, I don't lead I don't lead investments now so it's it's something for the lead investor to do so it's not something but I would sort of uh, you know try and um, try and suggest uh, not getting not getting too much into these into these uh, into these discussions uh, with founders and not it's sort of uh, not the uh, not something that's that's my I'm sure many investors would have a very different perspective here. Uh, but it's not something that uh, that I uh, that uh, that you know that I tend to do now in terms of negotiating the terms of value uh, and introducing all these things like like liquidation preference, et cetera. Um, because uh, you know the yes. Yeah, I was just thinking. Um, uh, we've just got about ten minutes left, and Lily's got a question here. Sure. So I'm just wondering if I can divert slightly. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So because you've been angel investing for a long time. And we've all grown up with traditional metrics. Well, how are you thinking and acting with impact investing now? Yes, um, I definitely, uh, definitely interested in uh, in in uh, in impact investing because uh, I think uh, um, they are going to be the far more. I've done some investing in nonprofits, and I uh, I think if the and the biggest challenge with nonprofits is they don't scale. Um, so if it can be uh, an investment, uh, if it can be, it, if it can do a lot of, if it can do social good, and if it's also scalable, uh, it's super interesting to me. Um, so uh, it is, uh, it's just one, which is one more reason I'm quite excited about spending time in New Zealand. I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space in in New Zealand. Mm, that's the key yeah. there, isn't it? It's the scaling part of it. If you can scale, then you can actually then make something happen with it. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. May, may I ask questions? a question? Sure. Yeah, go for it, Lily. Kia ora. Um, people, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Lily. Great. Okay. Kia ora, Ramesh. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Very, very interesting. Uh, my name is Lily Tolga Bay. I'm one of our fellows. I represent our our, our Māori tangata whenua styles. And uh, one mm. thing I just wanted to ask with you, Ramesh, is because in terms of our, many of our VCs that are within the fellowship, um, but the focus is always financial, and I understand that because that's what VC is about, financial mm -hmm. investment for 10 exchange returns. Uh, however, within Aotearoa, and as part of the fellowship, our whole kaupapa is about creating um, solutions, global solutions, utilising Aotearoa New Zealand as an incubation nation. Mm -hmm. So which means we have to sort of think slightly differently to how things are normally done. When mm -hmm. it comes to multi dim and multi organizations and multi businesses, the biggest factor is actually building the relationships first before we even talk the money side. And, and there are many multi organizations that, that have the ability to scale, not as nonprofits, but it's really about that relationship building and that trust. Um, but also it's about, it's long term. And so for, for VCs, that's sort of not, not on your cards, is it? What are your thoughts about trying to link with Māori organisations? 
Yeah, no, I'd love to. I'd love to learn. You know, maybe we can have a chat offline, uh, and you can you know, share some of your uh, your insights here. Um, I'd love to. Uh, um, yeah, I'd love to learn more about how you know what sort of how they approach how they approach it. Um, something else that I'm that I uh, was going to cover uh, is that you know even 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 for a typical VC that's looking that's doing it you know purely the tip of, uh, for uh, for a financial return, you need to be very very patient. Uh, like the other example I gave, the Asai example, it took it took twelve years for a return. So many of these, many of these, so you need many of these uh, startups takes before you can get a cash return takes seven to ten years, which is a fairly long, long horizon. Um, and I, I wonder, maybe let me throw this back to you. I mean, I'm in uh, in like in Indian in Indian culture, um, you know, traditionally. It's considered quite, you know, you, you don't want. It's, it's not something you talk about the finan the, the financial return. It's it's meant to be a little more sort of subtle in the background. It's it's so obvious that you're doing it for a financial return. It's not even talked about as you know. Can, is that is that similar or is that not even a factor? Uh, uh, the financial... that, 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 yeah, no, that's that, that's very similar, very similar, okay. and. Because once once again, it's not just about but the financial. It's, it's everything that encompasses that that um, progress, but it also brings into the community at stake as well. All the different stakeholders within the community. So many of our investments involve um, supporting the well-being, the housing structures, the social structures, the environmental structures. So so <laughs> w w when we do deals, it encompasses the whole um all, all of those aspects as well so it's so it's, it's not simple but mm -hmm, my, mm -hmm, my point mm -hmm. is that, that at the moment and i've been with the fellowship six years now um the, the thought pattern of our vcs from my perspective needs to change a little to to working with how we operate and how we think because mm -hmm. although they're a slower they're a slower gain um my belief is there a huge gain which can then be duplicated globally. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So, so yes, it's, it's certainly simply not talking about financial. In fact, that is considered rude. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can relate to that from you know from my own sort of uh, cultural you know background. Yeah, that, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the word rude. Yeah, it is almost considered rude as, as, in in many disrespectful in some respects. <laughs> You can uh, go and visit uh, Tolaga Bay with, um, and see Lily with your family. So Ramesh okay. is flying into New Zealand on Good Friday. So next Friday. Yeah. Well, safe journeys, Ramesh. We also Thank have you. another fellow Thank here you. living with us. He just walked past Tabiso. He's helping us create community development in this region. Um, and Tairawhiti East Coast is one of the regions a government is currently focusing on due to Cyclone Gabriel. And we need to change some of the ways we are operating and find different industries, specifically in the tech area. So mm -hmm. um, please hide in my if you're interested in coming to our homelands and meeting our people. Okay, I'd love that. Yeah, thank you so much. Kia ora. Thanks, Lily. Any other questions? Okay, I think I can skip this one. Uh, I think I've covered this enough times and already uh, founders. And I've, um, I've also covered secondaries, which which uh, which I support. Um, mm -hmm. It's good for founders and investors. Um, should I uh, in my in terms of my summary, I would say um, make make lots of small bets. Uh, when I first started, I was making I, mean, I was making larger bets uh, and not as many. Uh, I've I've realized that uh, you need just need to make you need to make a lot of small bets. Um, and from my from my experience, I mean, you need to make at least thirty bets to get that one, you know, hundred x return. And that's that, and that's really going to be what's going to if for if you're doing it for a financial return, that's really going to be the one that sort of moves the needle on your portfolio. Not uh, getting that like there's usually one investment in the portfolio, one hundred x return returns your fund. Um, it's something it took me some time to grasp that why why are, why are VCs so uh, obsessed by that one big you know billion dollar outcome because that's what they need to return their fund to even return their fund um, and um, you know as uh, early stage early stage and with early stage investing it's very very difficult to size market market sizing is very very hard um, for and I think I gave the uh, the uh, Airbnb example. 
it's very, very difficult. I mean, they actually created a new market, made a lot of people uh, you know, go traveling now as a result of Airbnb because it's, it's far more cost effective for them to live in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a different destination. So Uber, for example, another example, I mean, how do you size when you, when you first see the Uber investment deal? How do you size the market? I mean, they started off as a black cap company. Is it a black cap company, and or or is it is it a, is it now a taxi company, or is it a technology company? They're more of a marketplace. So how do you even come up with the? So if you if you use sort of conventional market sizing for some of these investments, or if you size the market based on what is already there, uh, it's you you could miss out on some opportunities because it's very hard to size a new market that they're going to be creating. Um, so. Yeah, so it's it's far, far uh, uh, more sort of practical in a very, very early stage investing to invest, to make bets based on interesting founders. Founders are going to be resilient. Founders are going to be very, very motivated. Mm. Uh, and in my, this is in my experience, I mean, obscure, obscure niches can be great. Things that are overlooked by by other investors. Two of my best investments have been in sort of these sort of uh, you know, obscure and unsexy niches. Um, and they need to be very, very patient for cash returns. I mean, some of these, Isaiah was the example where they, they were started in 2000 and they exited in 2012. Um, many of the other investments do. Uh, they're all, even, even, the, even the companies that are doing really well a few years later, it's all on paper. I, I haven't you know, received a, gotten, uh, gotten any sort of uh, cash return for that. These are all, uh, many of these, many of the investments a paper markup so it can take seven, seven, seven to 10 years, sometimes even 13, 13, 15 years. Uh, so you have to be very, very patient. Takes that long to grow yep, a that's, company. That, yeah, exactly. That, exactly. It's, it's hard work, time consuming work. Um, sometimes, I mean, I've given some examples where, where uh, you know, return, I've gotten my return after two years or three years, but those are, those are atypical if you make if you make, you know, uh, if you that those are those are probably, as I said, maybe less than thirty percent uh, of the of my investments that do that. Uh, with uh, with forty percent, you get zero, and thirty percent, you're lucky to get your money back. And it's it's a small fraction where you can get those types of returns, and many or even those returns can take a very long time. Hmm. Nice. Nice. The other, I mean, the other, and it's a, sort of spoken a lot about the about the financial, the financial return here. I mean, the other really uh, sort of inspiring lessons from angel investing are, you know, in in a working when you work with these motivated founders, especially in categories you don't know much about, where a founder has spent a lot of time thinking about a category, they teach you a lot. I mean, pretty much, you know, they try and teach you everything they know about a category in one hour, in fifty minutes. Which is actually intellectually super exciting and almost exhilarating. You know, you hear you have someone who spent years and years thinking about a solution to a problem, and he's trying to get you, he or she, he or she is trying to get you up to speed in forty-five minutes, one hour. So it's intense, but it can also be very, very exciting. So that's a that's a huge sort of uh, uh, lesson from you know, uh, a sort of inspirational lesson from angel investing, where you. Um, yeah, where, where, where it can be an, uh, an incredible learning experience. Yeah, that's true. You do, you get to learn a lot about a sector and about watching another entrepreneur go through their, their journey. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's funny, it's interesting when you're talking about Uber and Airbnb because both of those were second to market in, that, yes. in those industries. They weren't the first in those was, industries. Was, uh, Airbnb also second to market. Yeah, I think they were in the type of thing they were, from what I've heard. If I recall. Yeah, there was the, yeah. actually there was one. Yeah, there was one company in Singapore doing it around the same time. Uh, they didn't they didn't raise as much capital. Uh, Uber definitely was, uh, mm. but with with Airbnb, at, yeah, there was actually I think they were at the same time at least that I know of uh, with another company. Any last questions? So you got? Did you want to do a question, Lily? Otherwise, we will wrap it up. No. That's good. Well, thank you so much, Ramesh. It's been really interesting and insightful. And it's really good to see how an angel investor um, is investing and what they what numbers they're dealing with actually from on the other side of the world compared to here in New Zealand. I, I, have, I have actually found that part quite interesting. So we look forward to having your family here um, next next Friday and, um, um, and looking forward to having you here for your welcome week.
So okay. Yes, so yes, much. Ramesh. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Safe travels. Okay. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you. Bye. Thank, yeah. thank you, Michelle.